Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Grindel. I'm a PhD candidate just down the road at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, woo! Uh, where uh, I'm not an engineer, surprisingly, but uh, I uh, love the internet and so my research is internet policy and cybersecurity. And this is a great panel. Uh, if you know uh, nothing or an incredible amount about GDPR, uh, these people can still tell you more. Uh, with lawyers, technologists, it's a great mix. Um, and so uh, I thought we'd start with some intros uh, down the row here. Uh, Kurt, would you get us started? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online for things such as privacy, free speech, innovation. Um, and I've been, uh, my, my main exposure with GDPR was helping with EFF's own GDPR compliance. We have European members, uh, and uh, we also decided to extend uh, the rights under the GDPR to all of our uh, members. Uh, so it seemed like that, that was the right thing to do. Uh, and also, uh, EFF is an advocacy organization, and so we've been following the GDPR uh, closely, both uh, how it's being implemented in, uh, in Europe and on a variety of uh, legislative attempts within the United States to uh, create either state or, or national uh, privacy rights. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the U.S. Policy Manager at an organization called Access Now. We work on technology and human rights. We have several offices around the world, including in Brussels, where our office there was actually instrumental in the passage of the GDPR and engaged pretty thoroughly on um, its all of its provisions from the moment it was introduced um, until it got passed and now implemented. Uh, we also um, have been working on GDPR compliance and at the date when it became fully enacted, provided GDPR compliance to all of our users, um, just like EFS, so thanks for that introduction on that. Um, and now um, in our DC office, I'm working on what we believe a comprehensive data protection law should look like in the United States and how we can get that passed um, here for all of you, supposedly, if you're all from the U.S. Um, to enjoy. Thank you. Guys, um, my name is Xavier Ash. Um, I am a um, hacker and security professional. Been uh, hacking since the late 80s, uh, actually working for security companies since the uh, late, uh, middle mid to early 90s. Um, I've uh, run a consulting firm, did a lot of work uh, getting companies ready for uh, GDPR. And so, um, so I've got the security perspective. Uh, I'm Jairus Khan. I work uh, for the Mozilla Foundation on the Internet Health Report. Um, it's the uh, nonprofit wing of Mozilla. Um, so I do a lot of work looking at how are these regulations in impacting people on the ground? Um, do they work? Do they not work? Are they making things better? Uh, so I'm looking at it kind of from the, uh, the end user perspective. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so if the audience here picked this panel over K-pop dance lessons, learning about Mars, uh, Adam's Family Theater. Uh, they, they clearly care about privacy. Uh, but I also think it's entirely possible there are people in the audience that are hearing GDPR and still don't know what that stands for. Uh, so I was hoping, you know, the general data protection regulations, uh, could we get a top level overview from uh, one of the panelists? So from 1995, the European Union, which is a group of countries in the continent of Europe, <laughs> had what was called the General or the Data Protection the Directive, the DBD. And what a directive does at the EU level is it directs the member states to enact a law that does certain things. Um, so it is not a uniform standard. It is much like um, what you would think of having all 50 states with some sort of, of law on the books. Um, there's no federal um, overview, but there are, are a lot of different things that are all trying to move in the same direction. Um, the data protection regulation is a lot more like what a federal law would be in the United States. Um, it is actually a singular standard that applies in all the EU member states. Um, they have been working on getting it passed for several years. Um, and in fact, contrary to what you might have read, is not necessarily new by any means. And in fact, most of it, 
um, was contained was different provisions in the data protection directive. Um, so it didn't put a lot of new obligations on companies. What it did do was um, the EU was realizing that companies were not complying with the data protection directive, the different um, member state laws, and so they upped the penalties for non-compliance in order to try to push um, companies to actually enact the different um, provisions that they were supposed to be um, doing, including um, requiring that data isn't processed unless there's a legitimate legal reason for it to be processed, um, that they are allowing citizens access to their to their information, and there's a um, a route to retr um, retrieve their data profiles. Um, that there's a right to redress. That there's a data protection um, officer at different companies in order to receive complaints, and et cetera. So it has a lot of different provisions in it. Um, notably, the big change is going to be the um, the penalties for non-compliance that companies are now facing. Uh, any, anything anyone wants to add to that? Uh, otherwise, I, I want to dig deeper into a couple of those, uh, some of the protections, some of the requirements, that kind of thing. But and anything at the top level? I want to just to, to echo on that. Amy was just talking about the penalties, so you see what they, they are. They're up to 4% of your uh, basically annual uh, revenue. These are different terms. What's the, what's the global turnover. Uh, so for a big company like a Facebook or Google, that's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, also it could be up to 20 million euros, so even if you're a small company, it's pretty significant. But I think some of that uh, was to really uh, put the uh, uh, incentive into the, the large companies so they couldn't just be like, well, we'll, we'll take the fine and, and we, cause we make more money off of uh, not complying. And, and, and that's so. revenue, not profit. So if your profit margin is lower than 4%, not good. Uh, so let's keep on focusing on uh, Europeans for now. We'll, we'll come back to talking about Americans, but what are some of the new rights that have been added uh, through this regulation? Uh, so I'm thinking about portability, you know, uh, those kind of things. Could we walk through some of them? Yes, we can. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, how about I'll go through a few at the top level. We can drill down, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, uh, rec okay, okay, so you have lots of rights. I've just I have a, the there's list so here. Many. So <laughs> there's so many rights. Um, so there's there's a lot of there's some transparency rights, the amount of information that have to be provided to you, um, and a, you have a right of access to find out what the information is held about you right to rectification, which is to say if you want to change that information uh, that uh, you had previously uploaded. Uh, there's a right to erasure, which is to remove the data, uh, sorry, remove the data, <laughs> um, which, which actually hits a, 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 a point, it's a, it's a slightly different phrasing, but it does bring up the right to be forgotten, which has been an issue for a while. Um, and uh, uh, just to hit on the issue there briefly, uh, the, the notion of the right to be forgotten is that if there's some sort of bad thing about you that's on the internet that you can ask for it to be taken down or, or more usually to be delinked, removed from a, a search engine. Uh, the right to erasure does include a, a exception if uh, the rights of free expression come into conflict with that. Uh, one of the issues with the right to erasure is like a you know, for example, a politician wants to get uh, a scandal from their past removed so nobody can find out when they're uh, running, running for office. So that's, that's an area where EFF uh, is, does not like the right to be forgotten. Uh, rights to restriction of processing. Uh, so basically processing is doing anything with data. Uh, and so the right to restrict processing is to uh, basically tell the companies, stop doing, using my data. Uh, data portability, um, so this is, the notion is at least you could take your data and move it to another service This is designed to uh, bring about uh, uh, competition, um, a right to object, um, so object to how people are using your data. And that's, I guess, an overview. Uh, I want to uh, provide a brief clarification just because I think, I find that this issue gets confused a lot, um, and the right to be forgotten is something that most people um, in the U.S., if they've heard about the general data protection regulation, they've heard about the right to be forgotten. 
Um, and so technically under EU law, the right to be forgotten includes two separate rights. And so Kurt kind of lumped them in together and I want to separate them out a little bit. One is the right to erasure. The right to say, I no longer want to be a customer of Facebook. Facebook, you need to delete my data, all of the data that you hold about me. And that is one right. Um, if you want to leave a company, you have the right to tell the company that they can no longer hold um, the information about you as a data subject. Separate right is the right to delist, which is the right to say, Google, I want you to no longer um, provide this link in search results that come up under my name. Notably, they can't, this is not a content right. They can't, they don't have the right to request that any content be taken down. Only that when somebody searches for Amy Stepanovich, I would have the right to say, I don't want this search result to come up um, under that search. Um, and there are a lot of qualifications, a lot of restrictions on the exercise of that right, um, but it is probably one of the more controversial things um, that has come out. And again, in the United States with the, the First Amendment rights that we have, um, probably not something that we could replicate here. Um, but to pull those two out because you really want, um, I think very not controversial has been the right to erasure. Um, whereas right to delist has become much more controversial and if we start confusing them I think it starts to create some tension between rights that we want people to be able to enjoy and things that we might have a little um, less comfort about and I wanted to yeah um, talk on you talked about process uh, processing um, one there's a lot of language that adds uh, you know to be transparent in and um, and I think that this is one of the, the bigger ones and being able to understand how are they using your data um, and and being able to, to be transparent uh, to not only comply with the law but understand uh, you know what what are they doing with that and that um, you know definitely as, as we you know migrate this conversation to how this would affect in the US you know that that you know uh, marketing companies do things a lot differently over there uh, in the EU uh, because of the directive uh, um, and now that you know uh, GPDR kind of solidifies that and and uh, you've now got to be transparent about the processing of that data uh, um, will shine a whole uh, uh, has shined a lot of light onto you know the uh, uh, advertising practices of a lot of the companies there and so so I think rights are kind of the fun part you know of the rights and responsibility uh, oh yeah yeah if there's a question in the audience Um, so the question was about a Finnish ruling um, that the highest court in Finland um, said that the uh, search results of a convicted murderer were, were able to be delisted from his name. Um, and I, yeah, Google was forced to delist under this right. I want to qualify by saying I'm not familiar with the case, um, just as a prerequisite. Um, our organizational pos position on the right to delist is that we are not in favor of it as a general matter. Um, we think it can be very easily abused. Um, that said, there are certain ways that it could be potentially implemented in a rights respecting manner. Um, a lot of those ways have to do with um, its use with kids um, to make sure that kids activities don't follow them throughout the course of their lives. Um, I, again, won't, don't want to speak to that exact case, but there is a high capacity for abuse when we're talking about the use of this right. Is, is there consensus on the table or any, any conflicting views uh, up here about Axis's position? No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll take one more question, but we'll save uh, some of the questions for the end. Uh, oh, perfect. Uh, so I, on, the right side, that's one end of the equation, but when it comes to US-based technologists uh, and you know, European developers uh, uh, and network engineers, there, there's a set of responsibilities that come with this. So I was hoping we could talk a, a little bit about privacy by design uh, and the role that uh, technologists have on making these rights possible. Uh, would you be? Uh, comfortable talking about that, Jairus? Sure. Yeah, I think that I think that um, 
the the fact that now people have to think differently about the way data is going to be accessed and stored and, and whether that's going to be legal or not, um, I think really has the potential to change the thinking around a lot of things. Um, generally speaking, a lot of the business models of companies that are kind of unicorns today were collect as much data as possible and figure out a way to monetize it. Um, Uber is a data company, right? Yahoo is a data company. Amazon's a data company. They don't make their money from from selling books. Um, and the uh, and this isn't isn't my concept, but I think it's slowly becoming clear to a lot of organizations that data should be treated as a toxic asset. And by that I mean if you take care of it, just like if you have hazardous materials or heavy metals, um, it's going to cost you. It's going to be expensive. You're going to have to put people in charge of it. You're going to have to look after it. And it if it spills, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, and so I think that I think that privacy by design and, and designing um, uh, apps or services or whatever it is uh, from the perspective of okay, can we build this collecting as little data as possible? Can we do this collecting as little data as possible? Um, is really what's going to be necessary for organizations that want to do business in Europe tomorrow um, and possibly in North America, depending on, on what happens here. So I think. Um, privacy by design uh, is going to shift from a nice idea uh, into something necessary for startups and, and new companies. Um, so then, you know, building privacy by design into these platforms and apps, uh, what's going to happen to those that don't accomplish this? What are the penalties? Uh, I, we had mentioned 4%, but there are responsibilities at sort of a legal le level uh, that uh, I thought it provide an opportunity for Kurt or Amy to uh, talk more about some of the responsibilities that American companies have. Uh, oh, that, that American companies. Well, that, that bringing up American we'll shift company, to America uh, yeah, yeah. brings up another sort of uh, uh, question, which is what, what is the scope of it? So it, uh, the GDPR is covering uh, people in the European economic area. Um, and so for some US-based companies, uh, they're definitely doing business in Europe and they need to, uh, need to comply and it's, it's not very debatable. And then there are others that may be wondering, well, do I need to comply? You know, are they going to come and get me uh, here? Uh, how that goes? And that's, uh, uh, I've seen some companies who, uh, like the LA Times, for example, uh, if you try to access it in Europe, you're, you're not going to be able to get through. Uh, they decided there's just they, they didn't want to play um, and then others uh, are uh, uh, perhaps uh, don't have as, as good of an argument that they're outside of uh, European jurisdiction but they decided the you know I'm in the US what you gonna do about it uh, point of view so there's sort of a lot of uh, uh, practical questions for the companies about whether or not they feel like they are subject to these uh, these restrictions but I think the the Europeans would one of the standards is like whether you're aiming things at, at Europe. So if you know you take euros as payment, then there that's probably they're going to say that's aiming towards Europe. Uh, if you use a European language and it's not your language, that's aiming things towards Europe. So here in the U.S., uh, for at least the time being, uh, English is one of the European languages, but it's also our language, so it doesn't uh, uh, indicate that as much. Um, be that as it may, if they have decided that it that uh, they need to to worry about it, then they have to do a whole bunch of things. Probably a whole uh, a bunch of you received uh, uh, emails around May 25th saying we've updated our privacy policy, um, and I, that had a lot to do with uh, people putting in more of the transparency in the privacy policies. Also, uh, the GDPR. Uh, has uh, opt-in uh, uh, consent uh, being required. Uh, and so uh, you may have been asked to opt in to things that you previously had not been asked to uh, opt into or not been asked at, at all about. Uh, so some of these things, are, you know, changes were happening now. And then moving forward, if there are people who are going to do business with Europe, they're going to have to build systems where, uh, you know, there's a, if someone signs up uh, and they need to process the data, they need to explain what they're going to use it for, get consent, and do a bunch of things that uh, you didn't really need to under the U.S. environment. Uh, Javier, what happens if, as an American company, I have a data breach and some European records uh, get get lost or taken? So, um, the 
there is liability there uh, to to some certain extent, but the um, you know whether or not the you know the, the company was knowingly, like I said, you know doing business in Europe, that that there was some reason of, of having that that you know. Uh, um, uh, information than knowing that they were part of uh, the EU or EU citizen uh, will go a lot to that. Um, you know, there has been breaches released since um, uh, uh, since uh, G GDPR went into effect, and um, that has not been exercised as of yet. So we're you know that there is th those provisions in place. You know, we do have agreements, which I'd be interested to hear from others on the panel that we're. we're the agreement between <laughs> the U.S. and the EU is, and, and how uh, I know that that changes uh, often. So, um, and so we haven't seen, you know, from like a, a case law point of view, we haven't seen that actually being enforced just yet uh, to any of the breaches that have involved that. But that is still a concern because it's still fairly new, and that legal proceedings do take some time, and that if it, it still could uh, roll downhill to those U.S. companies. A word on data breach notification. Mm -hmm. um, so n as of this year, all 50 states and several American territories now have a data breach notification statute. Um, there are a couple holdouts. We finally got them all through 2018, go us. Um, one of the big, glaring, incredibly, um, potentially hazardous loopholes in most of those laws is that they really only um, are looking at applying at financial information um, or social security numbers, um, things that are, are tied to your um, personal government identification. And so the EU, the new EU data, uh, data breach notification standard, importantly, um, extends it to anything that might cause harm to a user. Um, and that, doesn't, that isn't limited to financial harm. Um, and why that's important is because we have long entered the world of the Internet of Things um, we now have devices in our homes, in our cars, in our bodies, um, recording lots of information that we would consider very sensitive um, and potentially harmful if it was released. And while the EU law would get to um, notification in the event of the breach of that information, most of the US laws at this point don't do that. Um, and so it was a, it's a pretty big step forward in that regard. Um, and it will be really educational to see how companies interpret that and what breaches um, get notified to users, and I think we're going to start learning a lot more about um, data breaches and how they take place and what information is released, um, which will be good. And just one, one thing to add as well, uh, the GDPR puts a time frame on your notification, 72 hours, uh, which is very fast. Yeah. Um, I think that that that's uh, uh, going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Companies, I think, are, are used to being a little bit more Slow. leisurely in there. So, uh, yeah, 72 hours after becoming aware that you've lost the data. Does it, is, there may be some companies that will be like, well, we're not, are we really aware yet? Let's investigate further before we're truly aware. Um, so we'll see how that, that goes. But it, the, the, the I mean, how the implementation, we'll see how that, that pays out. But the, the design of it is to try to get speedy notification, which may be helpful to end users if they have to do something as a result of, of knowing that their data has been breached. And also, uh, it'll be more, as, as Amy was saying, educational to us as large to see how common data breaches are, what, what's really going on there. And it may, because of the bad PR and whatnot that comes from a data breach, perhaps, hopefully, incentivize people to uh, put a little bit more uh, effort into securing the, the data. Thank you. Uh, do we have a quick clarifying question? Yeah, that, that's where the, you know, when you're going through a breach and you're sitting there you're looking through the data, so uh, 
through my intro, I, have to, I forgot to mention I'm, I'm doing incident response now. I'm running an incident response team for a financial company here in Atlanta. Um, and so, yeah, so you look through the data. Yeah, you look through the data, and, and you're trying to figure out, you know, uh, there's usually, you know, I, I work for a very large company. We've got a legal team that's got, all right, so we've got all these areas, breaches. There's defi different definitions of breaches. We've got to figure out all right, what data has been breached so that we meet all those those needs. So do I go and look to see how many of them are, you know, have lived in Europe for the last six months? I mean, that's, that's not 70, you can't do that in 72 hours, right? So, and, you know, knowing if you're not doing business in, in the EU, then you say, I'm just not doing business in the EU. If I'm doing business all over the world, then you got to say, all right, so how many of my customers have an EU address? There's the ones I've got to yeah, send it to. Now, whether or not they, they live there and do all the residency stuff, I mean, that, you know, that, I, I don't think it's going to get down to that level. But in, in general, uh, that's that's the level of effort that I see, you know, the legal teams going uh, to at this point. And so, what, this is a real, this is really actually important because this gets to the heart of what GDPR has done for the world, um, is that it is actually ramping up protection for everybody almost by necessity, uh, because you can't necessarily call out the EU users and put them in a special bubble. Um, and even Facebook, which profits from monetizing and manipulating information, has said that there are certain rights under the GDPR, not all of them, that they're going to apply equally to all of their users, which means that people in the US are benefiting from the fact that the EU has passed this law, not only people in the US, people in Australia, people in Thailand, people in uh, Argentina, um, people everywhere are now getting some of these um, extra protections. So just to dive into that a little bit deeper, I think, what uh, could you elaborate on what protections Americans have separate from these, you know, we think you might be European, uh, so we're going to treat you the same protections. Uh, so baseline, what, where are we at today? Do, do we have any? Well, we have some data breach <laughs> notification laws. We talked about that. Yeah. Companies can't lie to you. The FTC Act <coughs> can't lie to you. Um, so, yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get there. We'll, get, we'll get there. Yeah, in, but needs a little work. But <laughs> there's there's specific sets of data that is protected in the U.S. You know, so we've got. She mentioned financial data, data about children, some health, data about children, some data about children, <laughs> healthcare data. Right. Some health care data. Videos that you watch. The videos that you watch. Didn't Mary, you say, highest protected piece of information about you under American law is what videos you watch. There's a fun story about that. Yeah. Did we cover it all? Is it health and financial, health care, children? I think that's, that's the main data protection laws we've got. Right? So, so in America, it's historically been these like verticals of sectors uh, being given different laws, but kind of the baseline standard has been uh, don't read a whole bunch of text and click yes at the bottom, and you know that that's uh, American privacy. <laughs> um, there are there are cases from the FTC. Um, so the FTC has authority over unfair and deceptive trade practices. Deceptive is the lying portion. They can't tell you something and then do something else. The unfairness portion has been really interesting. Um, the FTC has used that um, specifically recently um, to get at really bad data security practices. Um, things like when Wyndham was, was breached several times. Um, unfortunately, a company that is now, does not operate anymore, has gone completely defunct, um, kept itself alive for the sole purpose of challenging the FTC's unfair authority in the digital security world. And they won a strangely weird victory, but we don't necessarily know how it will play out yet. Um, and so any ability for the FTC to, to exercise that authority is is a little bit questionable right now. But th that, that is at the federal level. Those are the main two prongs that you can have your normal data not in one of those categories protected under. Uh, you want to talk about California? Yeah. Sure. So uh, California has recently passed a privacy bill that that is, uh, you know, fairly broad ranging. Um, it, it hits on some of the similar issues as the GDPR, like as a, a right of uh, right to know, as they call it, like similar to the right of access. Uh, but it has kind of a weird history. So uh, once upon a time, someone was trying to use the ballot initiative process in California to put forth a privacy uh, ballot initiative that, if passed by the people, would. Uh, come into effect and be also difficult to change 
and then as, as this uh, uh, proponent was gathering signatures, went to the legislature and said, you know, if you guys pass something, then I'm not going to continue to gather signatures. Uh, and so they're like, deal. And they passed something. But they passed it in like two days. Um, and it has like typos. It has <laughs> nonsenses that like just end without actually ending. Uh, <laughs> it, it has a whole bunch of, I mean, not just like you disagree on the policy, but it's actually like badly written in a unintelligible sense in certain portions. And the, well, the, they were just rushing it through. The, and the, and the, the plan uh, is satisfying this guy so that the ballot initiative comes off, and then uh, it's not going to go into effect for a long, long time. And then there'll be amendments to it to fix all these problems, and everything will be practically perfect in every way. Uh, and so we're in that process right now of, of trying to make amendments to it, fix it, and such. So it's sort of basically a placeholder legislation that exists but will be amended before its effective date, which I believe is January 1st, 2020. Um, By amended, he means it could also be totally undermined. Right, you could do an amendment in the form of a substitute, as they say, <laughs> where you just put something else in. We amend the whole thing to be something else. Unless you're using Comcast. <laughs> so, Comcast exception to it. Yeah. so uh, with uh, GDPR sort of setting this global standard and the California bill creating a potentially flawed but uh, potential national standard, uh, where, where do people see um, states like Georgia uh, and other countries modeling their privacy legislation on? Well, in, in Canada right now, um, Canada is looking at, at what is the current state of, of data protection. And, and we do have data protection laws that in, in when it comes to medical information are pretty strong and some, some of the other areas are less strong. Uh, but the standing committee studying the issue uh, in their report, which came out recently, said, well, what if we just made PAPEDA, our privacy law, GDR compliant? So what if we actually just, like, referenced the GDPR in ours then the work's already done for us. Um, it's a who knows if that'll happen or not. But mm -hmm. it, it was actually referred as a suggestion for uh, parliamentarians to consider. So, and so I was involved with um, some uh, uh, lobbying efforts last year uh, with the EFF here in Georgia. And um, you know, while working on that, I've had you know lawmakers talk to me about you know things about this year and wanting to do. Uh, you know, data privacy law here in Georgia. So there is, there's definitely interest in in, in doing this, and and uh, you know, and this was I think before uh, that discussion happened before you know California passed there. So you know, uh, the idea of, of being able to do uh, something along those lines, uh, I'm sure, is on the minds of, of a number of lawmakers throughout the nation. I really, really, really hope so because. <laughs> I have been doing this work for way too long. <laughs> um, and we've talked in DC about a federal data protection law for a really long time. Um, and under Obama, they really tried to get serious about it. And they, they authored some principles that they were going to push and pursue um, as federal legislation that were essentially dead on arrival because all the companies said they were way, way too stringent. And all the privacy advocates said, ha basically saying they were way too weak. Um, and so if you don't have any constituency supporting a law, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, with the passage of the California law for the very first time, um, members of Congress and members of executive agencies are taking this issue really seriously um, because what could happen if California passes the law and Georgia passes the law and Vermont passes the law, um, then all of the US companies that so far have lived in we don't have a laws bill, um, are going to live in, we have 10 different standards we have to comply with bill. Um, and that's n not a better place for them to be in. Um, and so they're looking to pass a federal standard with what we call preemption, which would mean that it would preempt any um, laws at the state level, provide a single standard that companies could comply with um, and apply to every single state um, in the country. Now, if that's going to move forward seriously, I honestly don't know, but this is the first time that I've felt hopeful about it in my entire career because of the level that they're, the level of seriousness, 
seriousness, sorry, um, that they're looking at this California um, law. That's great. Do we have a relevant question? Yeah. So, so the question there is, is it realistic to assume that companies are in compliance right now? Uh, the, the last report I saw about it uh, said that, you know, there might be 20% compliance globally, uh, you know, 27 or 26% compliance within Europe. Uh, what are you guys seeing in the, the news? Well, all the companies I work for are completely compliant. So, um, so no, the, um, you know, I, I see very similar situations when uh, HIPAA went through its iterations, right? Um, the you know, first time they went around and, and the first HIPAA law, uh, you know, I, I, I had lots of consulting business with healthcare and I did lots of things and then it kind of waned off. And I got a lot of the, well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. And then, you know, the, uh, I think it was Obama snuck in a, a bill and it started funding, uh, you know, being actually going after and, and putting some penalties in. So, so uh, you know, I, I'm sure there is companies sitting in the wait to see bucket, um, you know, and, and uh, to see where we're at. There's been um, just, just in the, the market effect, the number of people that's left the, the, the you know, different uh, um, uh, major services like Twitter and Facebook, you know, is is also to be noted. I mean, that's that's real money that has been lost. To whether or not they, you know, you spend it in doing GPRDA funding, or you lose it with customers walking out the door. That's that's kind of the hope. And why you know, it, the folks here, you know, put together these bills is that you know, you, you either you stand up or, or or have the people walk out. So, it, it is early to say, but that, that um, you know, no, I don't think that we're saying that all. EU companies are 100%, uh, uh, um, but we'll, you know, let, let's see how much teeth this has on it. One thing I, to, to add on that, so for the, you were talking about some of the big companies, they spent years you know, developing other systems. Well, the big companies also have tremendous resources, so, and they have the fear of the 4%. Four, so uh, it may take them a while, but they will be targets for enforcement. Um, and I think probably will you know, maybe uh, uh, go through the bumps along the road. Um, though there, there's there's one sort of interesting side effect of, of that. It's actually fairly costly to get in full compliance with this, and the big established companies may actually be in a competitive advantage by having the ability to get past that, while a uh, smaller company trying to compete with them doesn't have that kind of like gigantic compliance department and, and other things. So there could be some interesting consequences based on the challenges of, of compliance uh, for for some entities. Um, so in my, in my experience, there are three types of companies. There are companies that are fully in compliance, which are not the majority. There are companies that think they're compliant um, that probably aren't. Um, and there's one in particular uh, that I won't name necessarily, but is still saying you either consent to everything or you don't use our service, um, which everybody I know who's worked on this law, including some of my coworkers, say is not compliant at all. And then there are the ones that are snubbing their nose at it. And I think with the, the complaint system that users are able to bring, um, that reckoning is going to come at some point, and it might take a little bit of time, but they're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, another word to respond briefly to Kurt's point, and it's something I've heard frequently, is that this, these types of regulations favor big companies that can afford to comply with this. Um, regulations, frequently come with a higher upfront cost. Systems have to be changed, as you said. And the GDPR, this doesn't happen in EU law, had a two year delay on implementation. They had a lot of time to get ready for this. And like I said, these rights were all in the data protection directive prior. So they really had a lot of time to do this. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. Um, but. We, if you get rid of the upfront costs, these costs are all going to even out. We're going to figure out how to be compliant with it. Um, it's going to be cheaper and easier. Companies are not going to have to hire lawyers that are looking at this issue for the very first time and charging them for every minute of looking into the GDPR and how to get compliant. And the, the costs of compliance will go down over time once we figure it out. 
but anybody who tells you they know the GDPR and they understand it perfectly and they know what you need to do to be compliant with the GDPR, absolutely, is probably lying. Oh, dang it. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So, I'm a cons- all consultants know everything. What are you talking about? So, uh, you know, before we open it up to questions, I want to explore a little bit about what's not here. So if you care about privacy uh, but are worried about surveillance, uh, my understanding is this bill doesn't really help you. Uh, and so I thought we could maybe spend a second talking about some of the, uh, the privacy issues that might not be covered by this uh, bill. Uh, well, one thing, you know, uh, when we were describing the bill, we didn't really kind of talk about what private data is. Because I think it was really, you know, important to understand. Because as Americans, we don't get that, right? We, we just, uh, when, when, you know, Facebook was doing, you know, had its, uh, what was the company that stole all the... Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is it... <laughs> you know, everybody's like, oh, you're stealing my data. I'm like, yeah. In America, it's not your data, right? And so I guess maybe we should take a step back and make sure we understand what is protected data under uh, GPDR. Um, oh, God, what was the question? What isn't in it? Surveillance. <laughs> yeah, surveillance, yes. yeah. Um, so notably, in the U.S., we think of information private companies keep about us and information the government keeps about us. The GDPR com- uh, applies to both. Um, so it applies to government agencies that process data in the EU, and it applies to private companies. What it doesn't apply to, and what the EU does not have the capability um, to regulate on, is national security, specifically. And so there's this giant national security carve-out, not specific to government generally. Non-national security government agencies have to comply, um, but the surveillance agencies are going to be exempt from all of its provisions. And the EU says it has no competency um, in the national security field, so they kind of leave that down to the member state level. Um, which is one of the reasons we have been um, very active on trying to push for surveillance reform at the EU member state level because the situation there is not very good. This this isn't surveillance exactly, but um, on the unintended consequences tip, um, one of the the things that GDPR means is that if you're a a student in the UK, you can request um, your data from the exam board about the notes on your exams, the conversations about it, anything that, that they have on it, um, which came as a great shock to the exam boards of, of the UK. Um, and I think that we will see a lot more situations like this. Um, I do think some industries are less prepared than others. Uh, IoT, for example, I think that um, another unintended consequence is people have a car. It's a smart car. It stores data about where you drive, where you go. You sell your car. Someone now has your car they can use the car VIN number or whatever to connect to the cloud service to look at the data. The car was not built in a way to segment that data or delete old data, and there's huge GDPR compliance issues there. Um, and this is kind of an issue that you can expect in a lot of embedded systems. Um, so I think, that, I think that we really haven't even seen kind of where a lot of the, the bumps in the road are because it's, it's so new. Jairus, would you also briefly talk about what Mozilla is doing on privacy, and maybe we could talk a little bit about um, uh, personal actions people can take to protect their privacy? Sure. Um, is that? I just want to know: is that a theremin workshop next door? <laughs> I think because it's. Yeah. I think it is. It might be. It might be. Um, it's weird science, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that I think that I think that Mozilla tries uh, to look at, at privacy by default wherever possible. So, uh, in new versions of Firefox, for example, do not track is enabled by default, um, and there are kind of a number of changes in the browser that are happening there. Um, we also do uh, a lot of work with uh, fellows um, and uh, and trying to find people who are doing work on the ground around privacy and and uh, and support and uplift that work. Um, I think that I think that the GDPR is a really important uh, piece that you know people on this table have worked uh, a really long time to make happen. But I uh, I think that it will only be useful if it's um, the people whose data is being governed that hold the companies accountable. And when it comes to legislation in, in Canada and the U.S., I think that that. If you care about your data and you care about privacy and you think the GDPR is good, then you need to tell your lawmakers. You need to tell whoever it is that is responsible for that here, because uh, it's it's not going to happen by accident. Okay. Any other last words of wisdom? Otherwise, I'll open it up to the audience. I'll walk around with the mic here. 
Um, a throwable mic. Oh, we've got one. Perfect. All right, throwable mics in action. So I enjoy the concept of the data privacy stuff, but for the United States specifically, to the contrary, is there anything that can stop a company, let's say a large operating system company, from saying all of my users who are over 18, because minors don't have the ability to actually enter contract, TOS is an actual contract you enter, saying you're going to actually forgo all of these rights, we will not play ball, you can't use our product. There are alternatives to our product that you can use, but for us, we're gonna collect everything still and you are agreeing contractually to it. And that's something that you can do in the United States today with our contract law. You can forgo any of your rights in a contractual relationship. So with that, how does any of these things actually change the playing field here? Local terms of service, any, any thoughts? Um, well, I mean, so the, the GDPR's answer for this is saying that you, you, you can't uh, uh, condition things in this manner, right? You, you, you can't just say, uh, um, you have to agree to all of our things or you can't use that to be granular. So someone can say, I agree to this and not to that and so on. Now, But I mean, here. So you mean here in the U.S. for Europeans, or here in the U.S. for? So, so you can't sign a contract to break the law. I mean, there's also no worth like contract is a creature of, of state law. Uh, now, whether something could get passed, right? You'll have people say, well, here, you know, we have to weigh the freedom of, of contract versus these privacy rights. You'll have there's all these debates about it. But whether it is within the state's power to say that some things are not waivable by, by contract, the, the state could do that if they, if they pass such a law. Yeah, so lots of support up here, I think, for more privacy legislation in the U.S., but let's move on to the next question. Yeah, thank you. Um, we talk about the po possible worst case of having a bunch of different state laws that would all have to be considered, but um, even with GDPR, you have the different working parties in all these countries that are all having to do their interpretation of things. Um, so are we seeing any kind of conflict there where, where companies are having to deal with conflicting interpretations from one EU country to the other, and you almost end up being back in the same boat, right? I've heard it's called a, a little bit like a Swiss cheese, where there are places left untouched by GDPR and uh, the countries can fill it in. What's going on there? Yeah, there are some different interpretations. Um, I think it's still, they're still trying to figure out what those interpretations are going to look like. Um, we are paying attention to that and trying to highlight where we think that the member states are not necessarily implementing procedures that we think comply with what they need to do under the GDPR. Um, I would have to defer to my colleagues that are over there who are doing the like in the trenches work on that um, because I don't know necessarily off the top of my head. Also that's a much better problem to have, right? If the problem is that you need to figure out which privacy legislation that a company is going to try and work a loophole through versus not really no. having anything with teeth, like I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> and maybe worth, worth knowing, so the, the data protection authorities, you know, there's like 30 or 40 of them in, in Europe. So you have a little bit of this interpretation issue, though they are working off of the same language of the regulation. While uh, in, the, in the US, when it's a state by state, oftentimes the, the language is not just an interpretation uh, of a particular word, but it's actually covering a different thing or you know, narrow or broader. Um, so uh, you know, like the 72 hour thing, you're probably not gonna find a, a, an interpretation uh, variants about how many hours you have, because it's pretty clear at 72. There might be some interpretation variants about when it is that you become knowledgeable so the clerk starts ticking. But if you flip over to the 50 state thing, unless there's a real effort to have a uniform law, and there are, you know, there's a, there are efforts to try to do that, but uh, without a lot of work, you'll have ones that have different coverage, different language, different structures. Uh, so it is a little bit harder and thus creating more of an incentive to agree to a, uh, a, a federal law. And, and uh, on, uh, just, just real quick, because yep. I forgot to mention the other one, is that New York State has also passed a, a, a law, it's a cybersecurity law, 
but it also can, kind of it goes toward data uh, retention and protection of financial data. So you know that, that it, it's it's meant to kind of help us in, in breach situations. But we already have a law in the books in in New York State. So you know I think the ball is starting to roll. I know you've worked a long time. It's, it's finally moving. So well, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. All right. New question uh, from the bouncy mic. Yep. Amy. Um, oh wow. <laughs> Um, Amy, I thought it was really interesting you mentioned that uh, the GDPR applies to both uh, commercial organizations as well as the government. And some of us in the room probably reminded of uh, the Privacy Act in 1974, right, which uh, does seem to have these similar concepts of, of, of transparency and, and disclosure and, and the whole data life cycle. Uh, in your experience, it, are there any uh, proof points there, like case studies? Is that a, a kind of a foothold to affect change, or is it not even relevant? Um, I mean, by, by definition, you say we, maybe we're halfway there, because we have like this citizen's protection, right? That's, that's talking about privacy, and, and yet we're still talking about getting the ball rolling. So the, the Privacy Act is wonderful. It applies to, to government collection of data. Um, unfortunately, government agencies um, apply it in very not effective ways, um, mostly by exempting any database that somebody would want to know what their in if their information is in there from application of the Privacy Act. Um, and I'm mostly thinking about the Department of Homeland Security here, um, where you receive a notice basically with every new program they enact that says this is exempt from the terms of the Privacy Act. Um, unfortunately, that has been the status quo since 2001, oddly enough, um, although you see it happening several times before that. Uh, the principles in the Privacy Act, though, are um, derived from the Fair Information Practices, which were originally written decades ago, um, and they provide the baseline for any law on privacy that I've ever seen, including the GDPR. Um, so those that basis is out there, um, and it's something that people have been aware of over time. It actually, those principles were developed in the United States, and we've ceded their, their leadership and stewardship of them over to Europe. So just a quick clarification here. Uh, this means, the Privacy Act means you can send a letter to a government agency and get records about yourself, kind of like the Freedom of Information Act lets you get records about a program. Uh, you can Google it, but I think we have a new question. Yeah, so Obviously, we're in the very early stages, and uh, I think everybody's a very strong proponent of the motivation behind the GDPR, but I'm curious as to what the consensus is amongst the panel of experts here tonight as to whether or not it is, in fact, a good law, or is it just the best we've got so far? Is it good because it's the first thing with teeth? Are there some things that they obviously missed that they should have covered? Like how? What are the trade-offs? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it good progress, or is it just the best we could do with what we had? Can we maybe go down the line with a snappy, like, comment, thumbs up, what you like about it, or, uh, you know, start down there? Sure, Jerry's. yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's perfect as the enemy of good. With that said, I think it's extraordinary. It's actually causing companies to take action uh, and think about things that they have not been legally obligated to think about for quite some time. Yeah, I think that it's 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 kind of like you you often you get this uh, you know averaging between the states and and uh, you you end up with a very low average. Here, I think we've got a pretty high average. You know, I always you know gr dreaded getting a project in Germany because Germany's privacy laws were just you know so horrendous to try to keep up with. Now the rest of Europe's got to do that, and so I, I think it's it's uh, it's it's a pretty good situation. I, I will I know I know what she's going to say, so I'm going to go ahead and, and steal her thunder. But I, I do agree that the uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll go on, on and say that the, the the right to you know uh, to be delisted is is is, is definitely problem problematic, and, and so that's the only dissenting on, on that. So, so I think it's good for the EU. Um, they have decades now of case law that define and provide nuance to the GDPR that is really incredibly important. Um, we have, as an organization, opposed these ideas that you have to then import it into every other country's law um, because it works within that context. We think you need data protection in every country, including the United States, um, but you should probably, each country needs to develop 
a package and a framework that works within their own system and that provides users the rights they need within their legal system and the nuance that each country has. Um, and so if you try to import wholesale the GDPR, somebody once told me we, they just want to write it word for word into US law, um, you're going to lose common law nuance that is absolutely necessary to understand the full GDPR. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would agree. We shouldn't just take the GDPR and, and make it you know, a US law word, word for word. Um, there are a number of uh, important things uh, and the principles that are doing what the, you know what the rights are, the the concepts that are involved. Um, there there are some uh, aspects to the implementation that I would do differently, I mean, and there are some aspects of it which are uh, more. You have to do an ex the thing the exact way that the GDPR wants you to do it, and maybe you can accomplish similar things in different ways that make more more sense. In, uh, in other countries' uh, context, um, there's also some things in there that you know were compromises that were necessary for for the GDPR. Similar compromises might be needed here, but I'll give an example. As one is a basis for uh, the lawfulness of processing, uh, is the legitimate interest of the processor, and for the uh, you know uh, marketers, advertising companies, and such, you know they're 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 like, well, our legitimate interest is bringing you ads that are relevant to your interest. You know, it's. There, there. We'll see how that actually gets interpreted, but uh, this may not be what people are sort of expecting out of out of that uh, provision. And I think also, you know, uh, data protection is spreading around the world. There are data protection statutes actually in many countries, um, and you know, it's not clear that like Europe should be the one who sets the standard for for the world, and that uh, that each countries may have their own uh, systems that would be appropriate to uh, uh, customize it to local legal traditions, their, their companies, their environments, uh, and including the United States. So I think we might have time for one more question. Um, and if your question's not answered, feel free to come up here afterwards. I'm sure a couple of us will be floating around and we can talk more. I'm curious about the business-to-business um, the -business aspects of this situation. I'm a small businessman, very small, one employee besides myself. I've actually made a couple sales in Europe, not having to physically go there, but electronic stuff. And all prior to the actual cutoff date, I haven't made one since then. And I'm curious how this is going to impact me in a business to business situation. Because my customers, I mean, I do industrial customers only. I don't have any retail. If you have personal information of individuals, right. it will, you have to comply with it, individuals right. in the EU. Um, if you do not have personal information of individuals in the EU, my understanding is you don't. But remember so, that you have to know that they are not individuals in the EU right. who have been there for six months. So work email address. This is actually selling to a business. Yeah. So, so <laughs> my only concern I would, was is I corporate to, to personage situations, I mean, here in the U.S., corporations are legally people, and that necessarily isn't true elsewhere. Yeah, I think the Europeans have a little different com concept of uh, you know whether corporations are people. Um, though I also would not want to drill down and give advice on your particular mm -hmm. situation. I understand. Uh, you know, I, and, and uh, what? No legal advice is oh, offered, yeah. and no plenty to. <laughs> All right. I, know, I, I did notice that when I came in. Any technologist in. advice before we go, or? Uh, <laughs> process advice? Uh, well, I think, I think actually for a lot of European companies that are doing business with American companies, uh, they're really worried about it because if they're, they're worried about are the American companies going to be handling the data in a way that is going to put us at liability, um, does the American company have like a, you know, an audit process and all that. So I think that, I think that um, most American companies that would be in a position to worry about it are probably dealing with European companies that are much more worried about it and will probably say, do you have your ducks in a row? All right, well, thank you everyone up here on the panel. Thank you for being here. Claps, round of applause.